Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. We are delighted that you are here, all of you, all of the students, all of the guests. We are delighted that you're here for the first lecture in this incarnation of Edible Education 101. We um, have a great, I think, series of lectures for you, beginning with tonight's, in fact, of course. But I want to say a few things first about how this comes about. The first thing you should understand is that we can't do it alone. There's a very large group of people who are involved with this class. I'm one of them. My name is Gary Sposito. You saw me on some list you signed or something. <laughs> but there are people from several different uh, places in the, in the campus, from the College of Natural Resources, for example, from the Berkeley Food Institute, from the Chancellor's Office, and, of course, from the Edible Schoolyard Project. All of them have been working really hard to make this course a reality at the level of quality that you deserve and that we want it to be. And I want to express my gratitude to all of these people. They've been wonderful, all the way from the design of our great banner that you're going to see all over the place now, our logo, to all kinds of things that you're going to be seeing unfold as we go along. We have an excellent uh, tech team here doing, the, doing that work as well. It's going to be a great show. I want to say a special welcome also to our audience in the David Brower Center in the theater who are watching on a screen. Uh, welcome. Welcome to you too. Now, I uh, work with a team. We have two co-hosts. I have been very, very fortunate to have two people generously offer their time for uh, getting involved with six of the lectures. So I'm hoping, uh, it's a little dark in here, at least to my eyes it is, but I'm hoping they can stand up just so you can see them. You can turn around if you're in the front. First, we have Mark Bittman from the New York Times. Mark is, uh, <laughs> he's on the side by Michael Pollan. Uh, Mark, as probably everybody here knows, uh, writes for the New York Times. He does a blog and a column. He also has a series of very well-known books, How to Cook Everything, and then you add your favorite word, How to Cook Everything Vegan, How to Cook Everything ve Vegetarian, How to Cook Everything Flexitarian, How to Cook Everything Fast, which is his latest book. And uh, these are also wonderful books, and if you don't know about them, you should look into them. You should find out. Well, Mark is going to be working with us uh, on four of the lectures, and you'll be seeing him, I think, beginning with Raj Patel's lecture a little later in the course. So we're delighted. Mark is here this semester as a distinguished visiting fellow with the Berkeley Food Institute, and we're very lucky that he's joining our course. Also, we have Robert Haas, who's one of our own. Bob, there he is. Bob Haas is a poet, he's an essayist, he's a translator, and he's a professor of English here. He also is my teaching colleague in, the, in a fall semester course that we give on environmental studies. And I can tell you from that that he is also an excellent field biologist. He's really good in the field. He knows his field biology. So he's, he's a wonderful person to teach with, and he's going to be joining two of the lectures and uh, which we'll be having later on as a, as a co-host. So we're very, very fortunate to have both of them with us. And lastly, I'd like to introduce the rest of the teaching team, the readers who are working with me. There is Josh. I don't know where he is. Right there he is. There's Josh. Some of you will be, some of you will be interacting with Josh because each reader is taking a group of you to mentor and get you through the assignments and so forth. There's Anna, and she's over on that side. And finally, we have Katie. I think she's over on this side. Yes, okay. Katie is also a farmer, right? She is. She's a farmer also. Not only a grad student, but a farmer as well. So we have lots of experience here, and I think uh, you'll see this come to the fore. So each of you will be working with one of them for your assignments and so forth. And you'll be hearing from them about these things as we go along. That will come in due course. So uh, I think that probably is the round of, of, of announcements before introducing our speaker. I have one thing I'd like to ask of you, though, is that you not have your cell phones on during the lecture. 
If you don't mind turning them off, that would be great. Now, if you're taking notes on your laptops, that's fine. But we just assume you didn't do email and you know surf and stuff like that uh, during the lecture as well. So uh, we'd really like you to be sure that your uh, your phones are off so they don't ring and all that sort of thing. Now, our speaker for tonight is Michael Pollan. I think yes. <clears throat> Michael is an outstanding, well, he is professor here of science and journalism in the journalism school, of course. We know this, but he's also very well known as a writer of books about science and about, more recently, the food system. I think it's fair to say that uh, since the omnivore di Omnivore's Dilemma was published that, I, in fact, I know this personally, that the lives of people I know have been transformed by that book by reading that book. They're not the same person. If you haven't read this book, God forbid, then uh, you certainly should be doing that. You should do that. It's not required as part of the course, but you certainly should be doing that. It is an amazing book, and you will not be the same person after you read it. Honestly, you won't be. It's, it's remarkable. I first knew of Michael's work actually from a different book, The Botany of Desire, which is another amazing book to read. It's, it's basically a kind of... Uh, exposure to uh, evolution, but in a way that takes a perspective that's very different from the usual. And I won't say more than that, but there's another great book if you want a wonderful read to curl up with sometime, that's another, another good one. My favorite uh, quote about Omnivore's Dilemma is actually one by the late, and I'm gonna say great, uh, Nora Ephron. Uh, I think most of you know who Nora Ephron was, writer, director. Harry Met Sally, Sleepless in Seattle, classic movies. Well, um, seven and a half years ago, the New York Times asked her, among other writers, read any good books lately? And she said she had just read The Omnivore's Dilemma. Here's what she said. I have tried on countless occasions to convey to my friends how incredible this book is. I have gone on endlessly about Pollen's brilliance in finding a way to write about food but it's not really about food, it's about everything. In fact, it ha even has a theory of everything that makes perfect sense, it explains absolutely everything as theories of everything are supposed to do. <laughs> and what's more, it's completely charming because he has the most amazing voice. She's got that absolutely right. Now, you've been hearing a lot, I'm sure, if you've been watching the award show about the theory of everything. Well, tonight, it's not Stephen Hawking's theory of everything. This is Michael Pollan's theory of everything, or at least most everything. <laughs> and so, please welcome Michael Pollan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm a lot easier to hear than Stephen Hawking, but not as smart. So you'll, uh, you'll have to forgive me for that. It's, thank you, Gary, for being here, for inviting me. And it's great to be a, a guest in this class instead of a host. It's always easier to be a guest. Um, so what I want to do today is uh, kind of tee things up for the class and give you some background, uh, kind of a crash course in how we got where we are with food. Um, because the food system's been transformed uh, in just a couple generations in a very dramatic way. And the kind of food system you confront when you walk into a supermarket, when you walk into a restaurant, a fast food restaurant, uh, is uh, very new. Uh, and important to remember that. It may seem like it's always been that way, and in your lifetime it has, but uh, not in your grandparents' lifetime. Um, I think I can speak for Gary and Mark and Bob and many of the guests who will be here um, in saying that though we bring very different perspectives to the issues and experience to the subject at hand, we all take food very seriously. It is central to the great question of what our relationship to nature is, as well as our relationship to one another. Food, which of course is a necessity of life, as well as the, the biggest uh, chunk of the economy, is one of the great keys for unlocking the way the world works and who we are. So I'm going to make large claims for food and its importance in, in your life. 
Um, Mark Bittman put this well the other day in a New York Times column uh, that he wrote on the President's State of the Union message, uh, in which food was not mentioned, uh, but could easily have been and probably should have been, in Mark's estimation and mine as well. He wrote, the issues that confront most Americans directly are income, food, thereby agriculture, health, and climate change. These are all related. You can't address climate change without fixing agriculture. You can't fix health without improving diet. You can't improve diet without addressing income, and so on. The production, marketing, and consumption of food is key to nearly everything. Uh, so I hope over the course of this semester that that perspective will uh, not sound so novel to you after a while. Uh, but tonight I want to look at food centrality in our world from one particular angle, um, one of particular interest to me. Um, and my central premise is going to be that eating is, among other things, an ecological act. That when you eat a Big Mac, and I brought one for whoever uh, asked the first question, um, or a Suncrest peach or a free-range egg, these are radically different ways of engaging with the natural world. The collective weight of all those individual eating decisions that you are making three times a day produces one kind of agriculture or another, and that, to a considerable extent, produces one kind of nature or another. Let me explain what I mean. Eating comprises our most um, important, most powerful engagement with the land and other species. Now, that's a big claim, but consider. It's agriculture that has shaped the landscape more than anything else humans do. When you look around the world and see whether a landscape is deforested, desertified, grassed, or tilled, that's, that owes to agriculture, not, uh, which is eating. Um, Agriculture has reshaped the composition of species. Agriculture largely determines which species of animals, plants, uh, and microbes, and, uh, and insects thrive and which ones are under attack. So for example, agriculture is the reason that in this country there are, uh, we're well north of 110 million head of cattle and only 50,000 wolves. Wolves eat cattle. We eat cattle. So we killed wolves, and we've allowed cattle to, um, to dominate the landscape in many parts of the country. Um, agriculture has also altered the chemistry of the water, the soil, and the atmosphere, not just by way of pollution, but by fundamentally altering the nitrogen cycle and the carbon cycle, okay? two of the most powerful ecological systems uh, that we have. Half of the nitrogen in the world's soil and water today used to be in the atmosphere. It was fixed by a process I'll tell you about uh, to be turned into fertilizer and added to the land. Um, and a third of the carbon in the atmosphere right now that we're so concerned about was once in the soil, locked up in the soil. Not as fossil fuel, not as oil and coal, um, but as organic matter in the soil. And that was released, by and large, through tilling um, and, uh, and fertilizing. Um, so tilling, the plow and fertilizer, those two tools, those two technologies, have completely revolutionized the carbon and nitrogen cycle. But this is not just agriculture doing its thing. This is us doing our thing. This is us eating three times a day. Wendell Berry, do you guys all know who Wendell Berry is? Yeah. Okay, well, Wendell Berry, who you, you should read, because he really is the germ. He began this conversation that you're hearing now about food, rethinking food and agriculture, and he began it back in the 70s. Um, he really started this conversation that you will be joining this semester. He wrote, eating is inescapably an agricultural act, and how we eat determines to a considerable extent how the world gets used. Now, these links between our eating, our agriculture, and how the world gets used is something actually once everybody knew, everybody understood. We were once a lot closer to these processes. Your ancestors were a lot closer to these processes because most people participated in agriculture directly, 
uh, or the getting of food or the, or the manufacture of food and the distribution of food. But the industrialization of food in the last couple decades and the disappearance of food growing and food getting from our everyday lives has obscured the fact that we too, like every other creature on the planet, are part of a food chain. Or actually, in our case, several food chains. We're somewhat different than other creatures because we get to choose our food chain um, and we also get to reshape it in various ways. Uh, and we transform our food through cooking. There's a great quote uh, I like about this by William Ralph Inge, who is a, it was an English essayist. He said, the whole of nature is a conjugation of the verb to eat in the active and passive tense. <laughs> That's all you need to know about nature right there. Um, yet many of us operate under the illusion that food comes from the supermarket. Um, and that, we, that so many of us believe that represents a tremendous cultural forgetting and amnesia. Um, and that we are losing this sense. Um, and I often, it often occurs to me as someone who's been writing about this issue for a very long time, telling people where their food comes from and writing books about it and making a pretty good living at it. This was like work that did not need to be done uh, 50 years ago. You could not have written a book like Omnivore's Dilemma because everybody knew the answer to the question I was asking there, which is where does your food come from? How is it produced? So we live in a very unusual time in the history of our species where we can, we, we have what you might consider the luxury of ignorance. Um, and it, it is at least an option. And, and I hope to persuade you it's not a very good option, but it is an option. Um, there's signs that this is changing, though. One of the reasons you're all here, one of the reasons edible education has been such a large class year after year on campus, is that we are engaged culturally, I think, in an act of recollection, remembering, and, and curiosity about these questions that simply were not being asked uh, when I was a kid, for example. Um, and we are engaged in this process also of recognizing once again the supreme importance of food, something that most cultures have, have known. That's why food is tied up with ritual and religion and, um, uh, and has a sense of, of uh, the sacred about it um, that we have lost. So just how important is food to summarize? Well, it's somewhat hidden, and I'm going to bring this down to a very concrete level now, but it's at the heart of some of the biggest problems we face as a civilization, problems that won't be solved without addressing the role of, food, of the food system in creating them. Let me give you three examples. Energy, right? Well, food uh, represents the growing of food, the distribution of food, the processing food, uh, food consumes 20% of the fossil fuel that we use in this country, okay? So it's a fifth of the energy story. Healthcare, 75% of the money we spend on healthcare in this country goes to treat preventable chronic diseases, most of which are linked to diet. It's north of $500 billion, goes to treat the, um, the symptoms of uh, a lousy diet. Um, climate change. Here the numbers get really squishy, but somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of uh, the greenhouse gases produced by our species uh, can be traced to the food system. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little more later about how that happens, um, but it is the carbon in the soil released through tilling. It is the methane reduce, released by animals, which is a much more serious greenhouse gas than carbon. I mean, in the sense that it can trap a lot more um, heat. And um, nitrous oxide, which is uh, a greenhouse gas you don't hear very much about, but it also can trap a lot more heat than, um, than carbon. And it is released by fertilizer. Um, when, when fertilizer mixes with water in, f in fields and is not taken up by plants. Um, now, the good news in all this is that whatever progress we make in reforming our food system, we will be making considerable progress in addressing the energy crisis, the climate crisis, and the health care crisis. Okay? There's a lot of low-hanging fruit for, for, for attacking those problems. Um, and food, of course, al also powerfully influences politics. You only have to go back to 2008 
where we had an enormous spike in grain prices uh, due to some bad harvests and some speculation on Wall Street, with the result that um, 34 countries saw food riots. The Arab Spring got started at that point. Um, the price of food is one of the most powerful political facts on the ground anywhere you go. So you cannot hope to understand the environment, health, economics, or politics without understanding how we feed ourselves and organize our food system. So again, food is fundamental. And in the last 75 years, it has changed more dramatically uh, than in the previous 10,000. And that goes back to the beginning of agriculture. Now that's the story I want to tell. I want to tell the modern part of that story um, to give you some context for what is going to follow this semester. Um, so this is going to be a, a short and uh, somewhat superficial um, review of how we got where we are. Um, and let me tell you about my own personal uh, recognition that something had changed. Okay, This happens to me before I wrote Omnivore's Dilemma. In fact, it kind of gave me the idea for Omnivore's Dilemma. I grew up on the East Coast. Uh, I grew up on Long Island and then New York City. And my sense of what agriculture was was very much shaped by eastern, tiny, picket fancy farms. Not, you never saw a farm more than 100 acres. Yeah, I'm thinking about New, New England on Long Island. Uh, and I thought that's what agriculture was. And while I was still living there, I got an assignment to write an article about um, a genetically modified food uh, when it was just being introduced. This is 1996 or 97. And uh, so I went down to Monsanto and I spent time with their um, uh, scientists and I actually grew a genetically modified potato in my garden to see what it was all about and whether it worked. Um, but that's not what I want to focus on right now. Um, I want to focus on um, the farms that I was introduced to. Uh, and Monsanto wanted me to see one of their success stories, a very successful potato farmer in the Magic Valley of Idaho. And uh, so I flew out there um, and uh, went to see a potato farm in Idaho, classic place where the french fries get made. And I was just kind of, it blew my mind. Um, this farm was about 35,000 acres. I'd never, I, I didn't imagine there were farms that big. It was divided into these crop circles that you see when you fly over the country. You see those green coins in the desert. And what that is is a, a circular field, 175 acres each. They're huge. And it has this giant um, uh, irrigation pivot that goes around and uh, continually, and it's putting out water, because you're in the desert, fertilizer, and pesticide. And it was all being controlled in the guy's garage. He had a little kind of bunker set up in his garage in a concrete room. And you went in there. And there was a screen. And on each screen was like nine of these or 12 of these little circles. And each one, he could tell what was going on. Um, did it need water? What was the, you know, the soil temperature? All this kind of stuff. And he could direct what happened. And he would turn on and off his sprays of pesticides from there. And I asked him why he farmed this way, and he explained that he uses some pesticides. And again, this has nothing to do with genetically modified food. Um, he uses some pesticides that are very, very toxic. So toxic, in fact, that you can't go out into your field for three days after you spray them. There was one in particular called Monitor. Uh, and this uh, was such a potent neurotoxin that even if an irrigation pivot broke and he was going to lose 175 acres, he would not go out to fix it or he would not send one of his workers out to fix it. It was that dangerous a chemical. And I said, well, why do you use it? What does it help you with? And he said, oh, it's, it's, it's how we deal with something called net necrosis. And I said, what is net necrosis? And I said, well, if you've ever sliced into a potato or, or bitten into a French fry and you've seen those kind of brown lines, a little brown vein or brown dots, that's net necrosis. And I said, what is it? I said, well, it's carried by an aphid uh, from uh, plant to plant. And the way you get rid of it in russet potatoes is you, you spray this chemical. And uh, I said, is there any alternative? And he said, well, yeah, it's really only a problem in russet Burbank potatoes. And I said, can you grow another kind? And he said, no, that's the only kind McDonald's will take. So you see how the, um, the connections between our ideal of a perfect French fry and the reason McDonald's likes uh, russet Burbanks is they're the longest potato 
and they love that effect of the, the potatoes making that little bouquet in the red, in the red envelope, um, and you can't get that with another kind of potato. Um, now, once these uh, potatoes, a lot of the pesticides on these potatoes are, are what's called systemics. They're not just on the surface. They actually are taken up by the potato when it's growing, and they're in every cell so that insects that eat it uh, get killed. So um, the problem with that is, though, that you can't eat these potatoes during the growing season um, because they're so full of this pesticide. So what they do is, he took me to, he showed me where after they harvest the potatoes, they go into these gigantic atmosphere-controlled sheds that look, they're the size of a stadium. Um, and, and we went into one of these, and the temperature was carefully adjusted. It was cold, and um, the, the potatoes were piled in a giant pyramid. Um, I've never seen so many potatoes in my life. And I said, why? And he said, well, we can't sell them right away because of all the pesticides. So they have to off-gas their chemicals, and that takes about six weeks. And then you can eat them. Um, it's sort of like a new carpet uh, or, you know, a new office building. You just don't want to be near it for a while. So it's like, wow, okay, so this is how the french fries get made. How interesting. Um, and then very soon after that, I was reporting another story and I was driving down Route 5 and many of you have made this drive from San Francisco to LA or back and you know that something, there's some, something very striking on the way and I had never done this drive and um, I was heading south and suddenly, you know, it was a beautiful fall day, the Golden Hills, uh, you know, were spread out and the sky was blue and to a New Yorker this was such a treat and then suddenly in this idyllic scene, this smell assaulted my nostrils. And it was like the last time I had smelled anything like it, it was in the men's room at the old Port Authority in New York, which you're not old enough to remember, but it was really nasty. But when I looked around, nothing had changed. It was just golden California hills as far as I could see. And it took three miles before I came to what? Harris, Harris Ranch, yeah, known to its neighbors as Cowschwitz. No, it is. I don't call it that. Um, and this is a gigantic feedlot. Uh, I think it's got, uh, I don't know how many head it has. Some, it looked like 50,000 head, and they're right on the road. I mean, it's actually the best feedlot in the country in that it's most open to journalists and people can actually see what's going on. Most feedlots are hidden in the high plains off the main roads. Um, and there is this giant bunk. Uh, feed bunk along the, the, the highway and the animals are eating and in the distance you will see another two great pyramids. One is corn, which the animals are eating, and the other is cow shit, which the animals are producing. And essentially they're translating that pile of corn into that pile of crap and making some meat um, along the way. And there it was, the Happy Meal, hamburger and french fries. And I had had no idea how they were produced. So for me, that was kind of the wake-up call, those two scenes, and I've never forgotten them, and they really got me launched on trying to figure out, why do we do it this way? Um, what are the advantages? So this is the story of how we got there. Um, American agriculture before World War II looked a lot like the images on the packages today of American agriculture, which are completely deceptive, which is to say, you know, a house, a picket fence, a red barn, some chickens, some corn, you know, a bunch of different crops. You know, it's like the Cargill ads. Um, there's an image of American agriculture and it's diversified, it's small, it's family farming. Um, and that really was how it looked for a very long time. Um, you had small family farms, uh, you had crops, uh, plants, and animals. Um, Ranchers were out there with their cattle um, and their hats and their horses, and they still are actually. And I don't want to I don't want to romanticize pre World War II farming because it was it wasn't always so great, and it wasn't that always that environmentally sustainable. Um, De Tocqueville noted that U.S. farmers uh, approached the land with the attitude of capitalists rather than conservationists, which is to say, and and the reason was there was so much of it. And if, if your land got exhausted, you could move somewhere else. It wasn't a precious resource yet. Um, so it was approached in a very profligate way, a very exploitative way. But still, there was a key ecological difference to the agriculture we have. And that was, this was largely a sun-powered, a solar-driven agriculture. 
The sun fed the crops, the plant crops, through photosynthesis. The crops fed the animals. They grew their own feed um, for their animals. And the crops fed us. Um, and the animals fed us. And their waste, so-called, was not waste at all, actually. It was a great blessing. Their waste fertilized the crops. So you had a closed nutrient cycle. There was, in fact, no such thing as waste, as in nature. Um, the line between the sun, the farmer, his crops, and your dinner plate was fairly short, direct, and circular. Very few inputs, things taken in from outside. Uh, some seeds, some diesel fuel for the tractor, um, but most of the fertility was generated on the farm, either by animals or through crop rotations. With the result that in that pre-World War II regime, um, one calorie of fossil fuel energy, now remember, a calorie is just a unit of energy, right? Um, so you can have calories in a, in a tank of oil or, or in, in food. It's the same thing. Um, but one calorie of energy from fossil fuel generated on average on that farm 2.3 calories of food. Okay? So you're getting more than you're putting in. How can that be? Well, that's solar energy. That increment between 1 and, and 2.3 calories is the energy of the sun captured by the plants. It's the only free lunch on the planet, solar energy. Uh, and these farms made use of it. So from an ecological point of view, they were highly efficient. Um, one farmer could feed 20 other people. The number of farmers, however, because they could only feed 20 other people, was quite large. There were 30 million farmers in 1900. It represented 38% of the workforce. Um, by 1940, there were still 30 million farmers, but the population was much bigger, and there, it was only 18% of the workforce. 1960, it was down to uh, 15 million farmers, fell by half, 8.5% um, of the workforce. And the most recent numbers I saw in 1990, um, it's down to 2.6% of the workforce um, because we made that system, from another point of view, much more efficient. Um, there was a tremendous push after World War II to make make farming more productive, to get more food with fewer farmers. And the fewer farmers are a very important part of this story. Why? Why did we need so much more food? Well, there were more mouths to feed, right? After World War II, we had the baby boom, uh, and population was growing very quickly. Um, we also had a population that was a little sick of eating the food they ate during the war. Um, during the war, there had been rationing of, um, of uh, sugar, meat, milk and eggs and butter. And there was a, a real desire to satisfy uh, that with, by producing much more of those things. Um, rising incomes leads to changing desires and diet, as we're seeing now in China. Um, and there was this push for fewer farmers and more industrial workers. We wanted to move workers into the cities uh, to work in factories. But there's also a very interesting kind of hidden history here, um, which is that people in the government and industry wanted to shrink the number of farmers simply to shrink the number of farmers. Farmers were really troublesome politically in the progressive era. They had made common cause with labor, um, and they were a real threat. Um, and so there's a, a, there's a Walter Karp, an historian I'm, I, I'm, I'm very fond of, uh, wrote once, since the Civil War at least, the most unruly, the most independent, the most Republican, small r, the most Republican of American citizens have been the small farmers. And you can go back and see, I tell the story in Omnivore's Dilemma, uh, a real concerted effort by the OECD, this organization of big corporations and government leaders, to simply, we need less farmers. They're really too much trouble. So that was, that's why we were doing this. How could we do it? How could we change this system and make it dramatically more productive so we could get by with now less than 2 million farmers? Well, there were a couple different things. I want to take you through four important factors. First was technology. One of the really interesting things that happens right after the um, uh, war is that the war machinery is, is converted to peacetime uses in these two senses. First, we took all the research we had done on um, nerve gas to kill people, which we were doing, and uh, the Germans were doing, and we converted that into pesticide manufacture. A lot of those chemical compounds are the same, just smaller doses. 
Um, and then at the same time, we were making munitions, right? Lots of uh, bombs, which are made with ammonium nitrate, or were then. Ammonium nitrate, as it happens, is the same ingredient in fertilizer. Um, it's very explosive, uh, as, um, well, some terrorists have, have discovered. Uh, and um, there was actually this, uh, this oversupply of ammonium nitrate, end of the war, what are we going to do with it? The USDA had a plan. They said, let's just spray it on the forest and help the forest grow. And someone else said, no, let's put it on the farmland. And so at a, a certain date, in 1947, the munitions plant at Muscle Shoals, Alabama, where a lot of this ammonium nitrate was produced, converted from making bombs to making fertilizer for farms. Very important shift. Um, and it's the reason that uh, Vandana Shiva uh, says in, a, in a, a, a famous line of hers that we're still eating the leftovers of World War II. Uh, and in that sense, we are. Um, research also drove this change. We figured out how to hybridize corn seed. And this happened before World War II, but really sunk a lot of money into hybridizing uh, corn. Corn is easier to hybridize than a lot of crops. You can't hybridize wheat, for example. When you hybridize something, you get a boost in yield, but you also get to control the intellectual property, because if you plant the seed from a hybrid plant, you don't get the same plant. You get one of the parents, which isn't going to be as good. Um, so with that kind of control of the intellectual property, lots of seed companies were willing to invest a fortune in corn and raise the yield. Uh, and they did. Uh, the yields of corn go up from like uh, 40 bushels an acre to more than 200 bushels an acre in a couple decades. An amazing achievement. Um, but you couldn't do that without uh, fertilizer, um, that density. The way, you make, the way you make corn more productive is not that e each plant still has like two ears of corn, but instead of having, um, you know, I don't know, a couple hundred plants, you get 30,000 in an acre, and you squeeze them. If you go to a cornfield today, you can't walk through it anymore. You used to be able to walk through it. And that's because the plants are so close together because you have enough fertilizer to keep them all fed. Um, policy also played a very important role. Um, and this, uh, especially through the 60s and the 70s, um, the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, which really sets the rules for this whole food industry or game that we were talking about, uh, really urged farmers to focus not on many crops, but one or two crops, okay? They tried very hard to get, and the, 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 the famous phrase of the time was plant fence row to fence row, uh, get bigger, get out, consolidate, and go to monoculture. And again, when you go to a monoculture, which is lots of one crop, like corn, you could never do that without fertilizer because you would exhaust your soil. So that's why I think fertilizer, which we don't talk about so much, is the really key technology here in so many ways. Um, Nixon, President Nixon, uh, faced a crisis in the mid-'70s. Food price inflation got very high um, for reasons we don't have to go into. But, um, uh, and he was really worried. Um, and there were protests. There were women in the street protesting the price of butter and eggs in the 70s. And um, he hired a new agriculture secretary, a, a, a brilliant agricultural economist named um, Earl Butts. And his job was get food prices down. And Butts figured out how to do that by changing the way that we subsidize agriculture. Um, and we, swift, we switched from a, a system of price supports to basically hold prices up and support farmers that way to cutting them checks and allowing them to grow as much as they wanted. Before that, we put limits on how much you could grow because growing too much is a huge problem for agriculture. Um, and since that period, the big crisis in agriculture has been overproduction, not underproduction. And whoever talks to you about you know, we need to feed the world. We'll, we'll have many conversations about this in the, in the semester. Should be reminded that most of the time, including now, the problem for farmers and the problem for the planet is too much food, not too little food. Um, uh, and then, uh, and they focused in particular, farmers were encouraged to focus on corn and soy. There was a lot of research on them. They were good partners in the field because the corn was a legume, which means it fixes a little bit of nitrogen itself, uh, and it would take turns. And it still does take turns. Corn and soy rotation is the rotation of American agriculture. Now, this regime works because of cheap oil um, and because of the perversity of farm economics. There's a strange phenomenon in farming. It's a little different than other businesses. Um, when you're in another business and the price, let's say you make cars, and, um, and the price of uh, cars is falling because people aren't buying cars, 
what you do is you close down a, a, an assembly line. You shrink production until demand and supply catch up. Farmers don't think that way. Farmers in general are small businessmen and women um, uh, operating in a very uh, large economy. And they're more concerned about cash flow than anything else. So if the price of corn falls 10% and it was steadily falling through the 70s and 80s, um, their first instinct is not to get all together and cut down on corn production, which would be the rational thing to do if they were sufficiently well organized or the government could help them organize. No, it's to produce 10% more corn. So you, you stay even. You can pay your note and, and take care of all your expenses. So you have this vicious circle um, where farmers, as prices go down, produce more and prices go further and further down and you get this great oversupply of crops. And we did, and that's exactly what the government wanted to happen. One of the key things about food to keep in mind is, and this, this affects what's happening in the politics of food today, is that leaders, political leaders, love cheap food. Because when they don't have it, you know, they lose their head sometimes. They learned that during the French Revolution. Um, and, the, and the dictators in the Arab world learned that in 2008 and 2009 and 2010. Um, so there's enormous pressure to keep food prices low, no matter what the cost of doing that. And I think you see that with the Obama administration, where taking any steps to make the system more sustainable that would raise prices are just simply not uh, something that they want to consider. Um, so, but this works. Uh, we, food got cheaper. And, um, and the percentage of the food that, uh, the percentage of our income we use on food uh, went down, 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 down. Um, but even though it still looked like farms, it was a whole new ecology, a whole new ecosystem. The logic of ecology, or biology, is replaced by the logic of the factory. So you go from this circular system where each species is in a kind of synergistic relationship with another to a factory model where you take these inputs, seeds, fertilizer, water, uh, pesticides, and then you get these outputs and then you have some waste along the way. Um, and that's kind of where we are. Um, uh, and basically what we do now is we use sunlight and oil to create um, a lot of corn. And then this corn does all sorts of things uh, in, in the economy and in the food system. Why corn? Well, a couple reasons. It's a very productive plant. It's one of the best ways to get carbohydrate energy off of land and sun. But then the other reasons I talked about, the uh, intellectual property is controllable. Uh, it lends itself to mechanization. You can harvest, you can plant it with machines, you can harvest it with machines. It's a great crop. But we're spending, we're putting 50 gallons of oil on our cornfields every year in the form of fertilizer and diesel and things like that. Um, what would be more efficient, of course, is if we could simply drink that oil directly. Um, but that doesn't happen yet. Um, this is wildly successful. As I said, we go from 40 bushels of corn per acre to uh, before World War II to more than 200. Uh, and this flood of cheap corn, which I, I detail if you want to read more about it in the first third of Omnivore's Dilemma, revolutionizes the food system um, down the line. Um, it leads to this consolidation of farms um, and the farm depression in the 1980s. We go from 10 million farms to less than 2 million almost overnight. And from each farmer feeding, what did I say, 20 people or 40 people, we move to one farmer now able to feed 150 people. These are incredibly productive, some of the most productive individuals who have ever lived. One person feeds 150 other people. Um, it's also led to the exodus of animals from farms because they were focusing on one crop. And also it was no longer profitable to um, grow food to feed your cattle or pigs, because there was this subsidized corn that was dirt cheap uh, that was in the market that you could buy for less than it cost to grow it. So there's an exodus of animals off of farms and onto uh, feedlots. And there are many incentives to create feedlots built into the tax code and beginning in the 60s uh, and into the 70s. Uh, so the factory idea that was on the farm now comes to the raising of animals on feedlots, the kind of scene that I saw at Harris Ranch. Now, this is a great boon. Um, from several perspectives. Uh, as I said, the percentage of an American's income spent on food goes from, in 1910, 24% to uh, 1960, 18%, and today, less than 9.5%. That is less than any people in the history of humanity 
any people anywhere else in the world right now. Um, we spend less on food than anybody. So you have to count this an achievement. Um, but you also, at the same time, have to recognize that it's uh, insidious and creates all sorts of problems. The falling price of food has uh, now become a linchpin of the economy, makes it very hard to change the food system, because anything you do to it to improve it, let's say you want to remove antibiotics from livestock, you find that the price will go up a little bit. But now there are millions of people who are dependent on cheap food. It's baked into our society now um, and, and very hard to change. Um, and it is the reason, I would contend, that we have put up with falling wages in this country um, since the 1970s. Food was getting cheaper. Cheap food subsidized the, the collapse in wages. So, what other costs? Well, it turns out cheap food is incredibly expensive if you take a holistic and ecological view of the real costs. And I'll just run through these quickly. Um, it means you need a chemically dependent agriculture to produce at these levels. Monoculture depends on heavy chemical intervention. Um, and this word monoculture, I think, is one of the key terms to take with you through the semester. So many of the problems of modern agriculture are the result of monoculture. Because when you grow too much of the same thing, you create a banquet for pests. And they will um, have, their, their population will explode because they have endless supply of food. And they will be there year after year. And the way you deal with it is chemicals. If you're willing to diversify, you don't need pesticides. Or you don't need many pesticides. Um, and so most of the, the, the things you worry about in our food system, whether you worry about GMOs, whether you worry about pesticides, um, trace to the fact that we are, agriculture relies on monocultures. Uh, second point, this is an oil dependent food chain. That is a powerful and new ingredient in, our, in the way we grow food. There are fossil fuels in the fertilizer, the pesticides, the farm machinery, the processing, the long distance transportation, and these new global supply chains. Um, it is the reason why it makes sense to move food all over the world the way we do. Um, to uh, catch supposedly sustainable salmon in Alaska, ship them to China as we do, have them filleted there, and then ship them back to the United States and sometimes to Alaska. It is the reason why uh, we export sugar cookies to Denmark and import sugar cookies from, De from Denmark, a trade that uh, an economist in the 70s uh, pointed out. Uh, he said, wouldn't it wouldn't it be more efficient to simply swap recipes? <laughs> but in an era of cheap oil, why not? Why not? Um, so oil is really key. And it means that when we eat from the industrial food chain, we are eating oil and a lot of it. How much of it? Well, that's what my burger is here for and that little um, pitcher of oil. And let me just show you how much oil goes into that. So this is a... Uh, um, I think it's a double quarter pounder, double quarter pounder with cheese from McDonald's on um, Shattuck, one of the least picturesque McDonald's in America. <laughs> and, um, and I work with some um, geophysicists and some uh, ecologists and some energy experts to figure out how much oil did it take to make that burger. I'm talking about the fertilizer to grow the corn, to feed the animals, to process them, uh, move them around, make the burger. Um, and it turns out, now these glasses hold eight ounces, okay? And I will show you how much goes into it. So, 16. Twenty-four. I should be filling them up to the top, but I don't quite want to. And two more. Twenty-six ounces of oil to produce one double quarter pound of the cheese. Okay, That's a, uh, we're eating a lot of oil. <laughs> it's chocolate syrup. So what happened when we figured out how to eat oil? Well, we essentially, we moved from a system 
that produced um, 2.3 calories of food energy for every, cal for every calorie of, of fuel it put into it to one that now takes 10 calories of fossil fuel energy to produce one calorie of food. If you want a, a more succinct definition of an unsustainable food supply, it's that. 10 calories in, one calorie out. It's very, very wasteful. Um, and, uh, and a lot of our problems lie in that loss of energy. And, we, and you need to remember, food, unlike everything else we make, you can make from the sun. You don't need to use oil to do it. Um, so that's a pretty vivid index to unsustainability. Uh, another problem, unhealthy. Uh, it's an unhealthy food chain. When you build a system on monocultures of corn and soy, what do you get? You get uh, a diet built on those crops. They're not edible. The soy we're growing is not edamame, and the corn we're growing is not sweet corn. Um, these are industrial raw materials that need to be transformed to turn into food. They need to be processed. Um, they're the building blocks of fast food. The corn, is in the, corn is the animal feed, it's the processed food ingredient, and it's a sweetener. Um, and I brought here, this is a canister of high fructose corn syrup. That is the amount that the average American eats high fructose corn syrup in a year. 63 pounds. And I'm afraid to say people your age are probably eating more than that. Um, so that, and, and the reason why, well, it's a very cheap sweetener because corn is so cheap. Um, soy is used as an animal feed. It's the protein part of animal feed. It's used as a processed food ingredient. Uh, and it's used as oil. Half of the calories when you eat a French fry come from the soy oil in which it likely was fried. 10% of the calories in the American diet now come from soy oil. Um, so we are eating from this corn and soy monoculture. Um, the flood of calories that we're getting off these farms is mostly added or saturated fat from meat and refined carbohydrates, and we love them. Um, since the time of Earl Butts, the average American is putting away somewhere between 300 and 500 more calories than they used to per person per day. This is since 1980 or so. Most of them in the form of these additional uh, calories in the form of processed corn and soy. With the result that the average American man has gained 17 pounds in that time, and the average American woman has gained 19 pounds in that time. So this is another cost, health. One in three Americans born in the last decade expected to get type 2 diabetes by current projections. That takes seven years off their lifespan, um, costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to treat. Um, four of the top ten causes of death in America now are chronic diseases linked to diet. Um, heart disease, uh, diabetes, cancer, and stroke. Not all cancers, but some cancers. Um, by promoting and subsidizing and ensuring these crops and this agriculture, we in effect as a society subsidize that burger. We're subsidizing fast food. And in that period, since 1980, the cost of soda, which is a corn product, has gone down 7%, and the cost of fresh produce, which we don't subsidize, uh, has gone up 40%. So these price incentives and disincentives influence people's choices, obviously, uh, especially when you're poor. And we know that obesity and type 2 diabetes are diseases, by and large, of the poor. Um, economists have tested this idea. Uh, there's a great experiment. You should try it sometime. Take a dollar into the supermarket um, and just look for calories. Where can you get the most calories for a dollar? It's a really interesting exercise. Uh, you will find that if you go to the snack food aisles, you can get about 1,200 calories for your dollar. But if you go to the produce section, you can only get about 250 in carrots or broccoli or something like that. Um, same with uh, liquids. You can get 700 calories of soda for your dollar versus 150 calories of orange juice. Um, so we've created a system where the rational thing to do if you're poor and you're trying to stretch your income is to eat really badly. Um, fourth point about the impact of this uh, flood of corn, um, cheap meat. Uh, it has made meat cheaper than it has ever been. Um, 
and because cattle will tolerate corn, uh, but not very easy. I mean, cattle were designed to, well, evolve to um, eat uh, grass, right? They're ruminants. They have this amazing thing called a rumen that allows them to do something we can't do, which is turn grass, pure solar energy, into really good meat. But it's too slow. So we give them corn, which makes them sick, because they don't, they get, I won't go into it, I don't have time to go into it, um, but, but uh, it does really bad things to them. So then you have to give them drugs to keep them healthy. You have to give them antibiotics. Um, but it's fast. It's really fast. And, and efficiency is the driver of this food system. Um, you give them lots of antibiotics to your animals, and you get antibiotic-resistant diseases, um, which we now have. And these are diseases that have evolved in feedlots um, and chicken houses and places like that that no longer that antibiotics no longer t can, can take care of. And this also leads to food safety problems. Um, these animals, like the ones at the Harris Ranch, live in their own filth. Uh, and they live in feedlots that are really a, um, uh, I mean, you look out at that farm and you see black as far as you can go. That's not soil. That's not the color of soil in that area. That's manure. And so these are petri dishes for the, um, for the evolution of new microbes. And we're creating them. Um, so maybe you don't want the burger. Um, each year, the CDC estimates, Centers for Disease Control, 48 million cases of foodborne illness today, 128,000 hospitalizations, 3,000 deaths. Um, another problem, pollution. When you move from this ecological way of farming, this closed nutrient loop, to uh, a factory model, you are going to have waste products. Uh, water, um, every one of those cows produces 100 on a big feedlot, produces 120 pounds of waste a day. That's full of pharmaceuticals, hormones, as well as nitrogen and phosphorus. This is not stuff farmers usually want. It's just too intensified uh, and has too many other things in it. There's a feedlot in Grandview, Iowa, in Iowa that has, actually I think it's Idaho, I think I made a mistake, with 150,000 head of cattle. And it produces as much waste as the entire city of Chicago. But unlike the city of Chicago, which is required by federal law to treat its waste, feedlots are not. They're in effect exempted from the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. So it just sits around in lagoons, off gases, um, methane, nitrous oxide to the atmosphere, uh, leaks every now and then, and stinks. Downstream of these places, frogs get sex change operations they didn't sign up for because of the hormones in the water. Um, now, let me remind you that in our pre-World War II system, sun-based farm system, there was no such thing as pollution, um, since animal waste was precious. It was a source of fertility. And uh, Wendell Berry has the best quote on this. Um, and he says, he, he thought this was a great example of agricultural, agricultural improvement, which he put scare quotes around, uh, when we took animals off of farms and put them on feedlots. He said, we took a solution um, where the crops feed the animals and the animals feed the crops, and we neatly divided it into two problems. Uh, a fertility crisis on the farm, which we remedy with chemical fertilizer, and a pollution crisis on the feedlot, which we don't remedy at all. Um, so from an, if you look at things econo ecologically, this was an absolutely insane thing to do. Um, and as I said, our, our, our laws governing clean water and clean air um, treat these giant feedlots as farms, and they're usually exempted. Um, and in fact, now the Republicans just passed, got something attached to a, a funding bill in, in Congress that makes it illegal for the USDA to even keep track of where the feedlots are and how many animals they each have, making it impossible to regulate them, which was exactly their idea. Uh, air pollution, last point. Um, the stench of these places is not just an aesthetic problem. It leads to immediate health problems. There is a, when I've been on feedlots for Omnivore's Dilemma, dry feedlots, there is this dust in the air, and someone uh, explained to me it's fecal dust, something I hadn't encountered before. Um, it's pretty nasty, and there's high rates of asthma uh, downwind of these places. But it also, these places contribute huge amounts of greenhouse gases particularly methane and nitrous oxide, um, which, as I said, by an order of magnitude, trap more heat than CO2. And the UN estimates that uh, worldwide, something like 18% of greenhouse gases can be traced to animal agriculture. 
Meat eating is one of your, if you do it, is one of your most significant contributors to climate change. And changing the kind of diet you have would do a lot more than changing the kind of car you drive to reduce your impact on climate change. Um, and beef is uh, worse of all. Um, the Supreme Court has ruled that the EPA has authority to regulate greenhouse gases, which was a really important decision a couple years ago, and, and the EPA is exercising this in the case of power plants. So how about doing it in meat plants and on feedlots? Well, that's a question for the administration, uh, which has exempted agriculture from its new regulations of both carbon and methane. Um, and that's another key point to remember in this course, big ag is enormously powerful in Washington. It is one of the most powerful lobbies we have. So just to wrap up, uh, and I'd love to take some of your questions, um, you're going to be taking a closer look at many of these questions. I've really just kind of gone over them lightly, um, and others I haven't mentioned. Um, my focus here, the big lens I want you to see the system through, is that of ecology. Um, for so many of the problems of industrial agriculture stem from a change in its ecological foundation. The move from a system based on the energy of the sun to one based on the energy of, a fo of fossil fuels, from the logic of an ecosystem to the logic of a factory. I've left a lot out. Uh, the impact of this change on social inequality and labor, I've only hinted at, uh, on the welfare of farmers living in other countries that are, are flood of cheap corn makes very hard for them to compete. Um, we are changing their lives too with this system, but it's coming. We'll get to that. Raj Patel will talk about that. But what's really exciting and hopeful is that after decades of being under the radar, all these problems, public health, energy, climate change, pollution, have become inescapable and are now very much on everyone's radar. And they are driving this food movement that we're going to be discussing over the course of the sem semester, this food movement that is now rising across the country. Um, and also driving the rise of new technologies like genetic modification, which is a response to these problems uh, also. Whether it's good or bad, it is a response. So one of the critical questions now before us is, is there a way to return our food system to a basis of solar energy? And I don't want you to come away thinking that the solution means turning back the clock, because it's not. The challenge is to find new ways to harness solar energy in agriculture. And there are farmers, and you will hear about them in this semester, who have figured out how to do this. Um, and some very exciting um, farms that have um, restored the relationship between plants and animals and figured out the power of diversity to deal with pests. Um, and you'll meet some of these farmers uh, this semester. Um, uh, that we can, I think, return our food system to a reliance on photosynthesis. Should be simple enough. Um, and some of our guests will bring that remarkable news to you. So I'm going to leave it right there and thank you very much for your attention and uh, take your questions. So thanks a lot. Thank you. That was a lot to absorb, I know. One back there. Um, that chemical you mentioned um, that's used on the potatoes. is Monitor. That yeah, monitor. Is that still in use? Right. It's a good question. This was 1996 uh, or 7, um, and I don't know the answer to that. It would be pretty easy to find out. Um, the, uh, you know, these, these chemicals do have a lifespan because the insects evolve resistance to them very often. Um, uh, but on the other hand, it's very hard to introduce new agrochemicals. Um, the regulatory regime is tougher now than it used to be. So one of the, one of the perversities of our regulation is, uh, regulatory system is that it makes sense often to keep old, nasty chemicals that are grandfathered rather than inventing more benign ones. So it's a good question. Thank you. Um, I think they're recognized. There's, there's a question in the front row here. It was phased out in 2009. Thank you. <laughs> One of the happier uses of uh, the internet in class. <laughs> now, that's why I don't forbid it in my classes, even though it can be incredibly distracting, because every now and then somebody comes up with something useful. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, was the Nixon administration aware of these, uh, 
these problems coming from the corn and soy monoculture, or were they just problems that were that came out of ignorance from the issue? Yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer for sure, but I would I would doubt they knew. I mean, I I, I think that they were. Um, you know, when this started happening, you did have this conversation going on, and Wendell Berry was writing, he wrote a wonderful book called The Unsettling of America, which is about these changes going on in real time. It's a great book to read. So he recognized it. Farmers knew what was happening. They knew the only way to do this was lots more chemicals. But I, I, I doubt that this was on Nixon's radar. I mean, he had a very specific, clear political goal, which was get the price of food down as fast as possible. Um, and the consequences we'll worry about later. Hi. So, so you said that um, eating meat is one of the largest impacts you, you have yeah. on carbon footprint. What impact would you say that becoming a vegetarian or vegan can have on the larger system, or is that more just kind of a personal choice? Well, I think if we gave up meat eating, um, it would have a tremendous uh, impact. Um, and that, I don't think that's realistic. I don't think, you know, meat is incredibly prestigious food. You go around the world and as soon as people's incomes rise, the first thing they want is a car and meat in their diet. And, um, and the, the problem is, even as we moderate our meat consumption, um, other countries are increasing it, China most notably. Um, China wants to eat meat at the rates we do. We eat nine ounces of meat per person per day, okay? And some of us are making up for our vegetarian friends, so we're eating more than that. Um, <laughs> And that's a lot. And uh, the World Watch a few years ago did a, a little analysis that what if the population of China ate nine ounces of meat per person? Um, and they, I think their calculation was we would need 2.3 more worlds to grow all the grain to feed all those animals. So um, reducing meat consumption, though, is very, very important, I think. Um, and changing the way we produce it, because there are less energy intensive ways, there are less polluting ways to produce it. Um, and, um, but in general, politically, a, a message of don't eat meat at all, I think, is kind of a loser. Uh, and that, you know, I think efforts like, have you heard of Meatless Monday? You know, it's a public health campaign out of Johns Hopkins. And the idea is simply, what if we had a day a week where it became the cultural norm that we ate, you know, we ate vegetarian? Um, and if you go to the website of the Center for Livable Futures at Johns Hopkins, you'll see amazing calculations of how much energy would be saved, how much greenhouse gas would be um, uh, not emitted, um, and it would have you know, great benefits. I don't support eliminating meat, as if you know, it's even worth making that decision, but, but um, uh, I think there's a place for meat, because what was I saying about agriculture? The healthiest agricultural systems use animals in conjunction with plants. Um, and you're not gonna keep animals on farms just to um, fertilize them. If you're going to have animals on farms, you're going to eat them. Um, so I, you know, that's one of the reasons I don't um, uh, argue for a complete elimination of meat eating. Uh, we need animals to have, the healthiest agricultures I've seen have involved plants with animals. Um, and then there are all the places in the world, remember, where you can't eat without meat, where the land is too hilly or too dry. Um, the, the thing about ruminants, which is not just cattle, you know, there are other ruminants as well, sheep and goats, and um, I, I, right now I forget the others, but um, is that they can convert land that really can't be used for anything else into really healthy protein. And I'm talking about the, you know, the dry hills north of, uh, of San Francisco. Um, you can't put crops on those hills. You'd have, you'd have to use so much water and they're so hilly, but they're great places to raise uh, ruminants. Um, so there's a very sustainable meat food chain that you can conceive, and we have in, in, in some examples. Um, so I, I, I would I warn you off all or nothing thinking on this question. There's a question up here. Um, so something that I've kind of encountered in my own life is that a lot of people seem to feel like um, the decisions they make regarding the kind of food they eat are very personal, which to some degree they are, but do you think there's a way to, you know, in our own lives or otherwise, kind of socially move away from that idea and realize more the greater impact on all of these systems that you described, you know, beyond just what we want to do in our own families? Yeah. 
You know, I, I think that we are at the same time, yes, we feel it's personal, but I don't think we're totally aware of how influenced we are by social norms and what other people are doing. Um, you know, where did this idea that you eat meat as soon as you have a little money come from? I mean, that came from looking at advanced countries that have a lot of meat and, 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 and the imagery and advertising. And don't, and don't overlook, and Mary Nessel will be giving a talk this, um, this semester, but marketing is a very powerful force in shaping what we eat. So we're not starting from scratch. Um, our consumer decisions are heavily influenced by what other people are doing, by what's being marketed to us. And that gives me hope, I mean, that you can change norms. And, and we have done it on issue after issue. You know, think about smoking. Um, the social norms around smoking have been revolutionized in just a couple decades. Littering. Um, soda. I mean, we're, you know, there is such a conversation about the evils of soda and, and all these soda tax battles have actually educated the public. Even all the losing ones have educated the public and led to, we see, a decline in soda consumption. Um, so eating is a, is a very social act and it's heavily influenced by, by the social context in which it takes place. So yeah, I am very hopeful that these things can be changed. How you change it is complicated. I mean, as Mayor Bloomberg learned, you know, if it comes from the government and they're changing the size of your soda cups, it's an outrage, you know, social engineering. Um, but for some reason, we don't mind social engineering when corporations are doing it to us in the supermarket and they're putting the cereal at a certain level and making sure our kids see the sweetest cereals at the bottom. And that's fine. Um, but if it's done by our elected officials on our behalf, no way. So. There's uh, a yeah. sort of a related question from uh, Twitter. Uh, should an overhaul of our food chain and the way we eat start in our homes or in large production kitchens? Mm, can we have both? Um, I'm a both end kind of guy. I mean, I, you know, I think there's a lot that individuals can do. I don't think that um, so-called voting with your fork will solve all our problems, but we have seen it do an enormous amount of good in just the last couple decades um, that uh, people voting with their fork for different kinds of foods has, has changed the food system. Um, and um, large production kitchens, there's a place for it. I mean, there, you know, cooking is, is um, uh, a very, is very challenging for some people because of their, um, their work schedules and it does need to be socialized in some sense, I think, for a lot of people. Uh, who can't do it in their homes for one reason or another. And, and I think that there are opportunities to share that labor and, and, um, and efficiencies to be gained by doing that. Um, so yeah, so there some, but then you also have other ways of doing the same thing. You have, you know, four families will get together and one cooks for all four every night, for four nights. Because if you're gonna make, make something, you might as well make a lot of it. It's not that much harder. And then you have three nights where you don't have to cook. So I think there's a lot of social experimentation we need to address the cooking issue. Uh, who's recognizing people? Am I? Okay. Didn't, you gave us an answer, right? So now you can have a question. Yeah, okay. Sure. Um, so thinking more from a bottom-up approach, um, education is obviously a really powerful tool. And I've heard of a bunch of examples where, you know, if cafeteria starts implementing all these healthy food choices, the kids will go home and talk to their parents, and it has a really big effect on how the family eats. Um, so thinking about that, do you think it's feasible for there to be some sort of federal regulation of there needs to be a food component in science or history classes? Or do you think there's a possibility for real change in the school lunch program? Or is the big egg lobbying just too big for that to happen right now? Because it's sort of a chicken or the egg situation. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Education is very important. I think that our food choices are, are um, as much as I was arguing that we can change them, a lot of them get fixed in, uh, in childhood. And, um, and, and it's one of the reasons that, um, you know, Edible Education is named for the Edible Schoolyard, which is um, Alice Waters Foundation and project where they teach growing food, cooking food, eating food together um, at King Middle School and now at several other school, middle schools around the country. And, and her conviction, I think she's right, is that you've got to engage with kids early and give them a tactile involvement with um, the production of food um, and develop their senses. Um, it's a very Montessori idea. Um, and you know, whether as adults we can change the way we eat in any dramatic way is, is, is an open question. Um, I think there's enormous potential to use food as a teaching tool. I don't know that it, the, the federal government should regulate this, but in my own experience as a teacher, 
Food is a great way to learn about many other things. You can use food to teach people about culture, history, biology, obviously, nutrition, the climate, the water cycle, the nutrients. I mean, you know, across the disciplines, you could organize a beautiful curriculum. And I could imagine that in seventh grade or eighth grade, you know, across every class you took, there would be a food component. Um, it's a great way to engage kids. They really care about it. They connect to it. Um, and I found as a writer, too, I mean, if you can connect any issue, no matter how abstract, climate change is a great example, to what is on our plates. I mean, this is what editors always ask you, like, well, why does the reader care about this? Well, the reader cares about it because they eat. And people care about food. So I think, th I think food is, is, is a, a very powerful uh, teaching tool. There was a phrase in the 60s, the Diggers, uh, were, who were this um, kind of theatrical political group in San Francisco, um, and they called the edible dynamic. And in all their events, they would feed people. And they found it was a very powerful way to get people to come to their events and take in the message they had. And I think there's a lot to be learned from that. Back there. Yeah, I, I can hear you, but, but we have um, you know, a webcast, so they, they may not be able to. Okay, so I was, um, I'm pretty familiar with pescatarianism and how it's becoming more and more common, I would say. And I was just wondering what you know about the difference in the ecological impact of eating fish and fish farming as opposed to different meats. That's a good question. You know, I haven't looked closely at fishing. Um, fishing is incredibly, um, difficult ecologically, right now, most forms of aquaculture are not sustainable. Um, and the reason being, fishing's unusual. You know, it's the last kind of hunted and gathered food, right? Where we, where we, eat, we eat wild species for the most part, and we go out and capture them in their habitat. It's like what all food was 20,000 years ago. Um, the problem is, of course, we've overfished, and there, there is, uh, you know, there was just a headline the other week that the, the you know, the, the oceans are collapsing. Um, and so we have to take pressure off that. And the logical way you would think to do it is, to st let's start growing fish in farms. And um, the problem with that is, what do you feed them? Um, well, you feed them little fish. So you go out there and you take all the little fish um, and catch those and turn that into fish meal for your your farm fish, but you're still destroying wild fish. So the challenge is to come up with a sustainable aquaculture. And I think it's one of the great challenges we face as a society, as an economy, in the next few years. I have no doubt it can be done. I've seen examples, small scale examples. Um, if you ever get to Milwaukee, there's a, a, a big urban farm called Growing Power, uh, started by Will Allen. And he has um, a, this beautiful system of, of aquaponics, it's called. This is. Uh, a, Remember we talked about linking animals and plants. Here's how he does it. In these greenhouses that he bought in a, in a really rough part of town near the biggest housing development, he, he dug out a five foot wide, five foot deep trench, lined it with uh, black plastic, filled it with water, and then put fish in it. Above this tank, he suspends uh, a growing medium. It's a tray, a giant tray with gravel and um, in which he can plant um, uh, you know, everything from broccoli and greens and arugula and everything like that. And it grows on this long shelf. And the water, as it gets dirty from the fish, uh, is pumped up and then run along the root zone of all these plants. And the plants take up all the nitrogen in the water from the fish waste, clean the water, so that by the time the water gets down to the other end of the greenhouse, it's clean enough to go back in the tank. So they never have to add water and they never have to get rid of their waste. So you see they have that nutrient loop. Now how does he deal with the feed issue? Well, he was very troubled by that. Um, and he, then he started figuring out how he could grow worms in compost, and he takes millions of pounds of compost from the city, and soldier fly larva. He's growing insects, which is a great food source. You know, everybody's talking about how we're all going to be eating insects. We're not going to be eating insects. The fish will eat the insects. That's how it should work. And, um, and I'm fine with that. Um, uh, so we have to learn how to grow insects and, and things we can raise sustainably. I'm sure we'll have you know, cricket feedlots and it'll be horrible at some point. But, um, 
uh, and use that uh, to feed these fish. So if you're looking for a great business opportunity or you're engineering minded, um, uh, think about you know, how do we invent uh, a really good, clean aquaculture? Because we can do it. We just haven't done it yet. Hi. Um, so one of the things that you were talking about was the growth of the ratio of farmers to the people they feed from one to about 20 to one to about 150. And I think a lot of people would call that progress, this freeing up yeah. of the population to work in other industries. Um, so what would you say when you think about you know, sustainable, diverse farming to critics of that who are worried about turning back the clock? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that it will be very hard to have a sustainable agriculture without having more farmers. I think a lot of our problems come from the fact that we've, we've needed to uh, grow all this food without a lot of people. Um, and from one point of view, you're right, that's progress. Um, on the other hand, we need jobs in this country. You know, we have a lot of unemployed people. And so looked at from another point of view, the fact that agriculture needs more people could be a, a, a positive. Um, there are people now who want to get into agriculture. There are a lot of people in your generation who want to get into agriculture, and they need help doing it. They need land, they need, they need access to land, they need capital. Um, and so for the first time, you know, I, I described this decline in the number of farmers, but in the last or two agricultural censuses ago, the number actually ticked up for the first time uh, in history, as far as we know that there were actually more farmers. They were s these small, diversified farmers that you see at farmers markets. Uh, some of them are really struggling, but they want to do it. Um, so, you know, we, as we, to get fossil fuel out of agriculture, we, a lot of the fossil fuel, I didn't make this point, was replacing human labor. As we've used fossil fuel, right, all the time. It's, it's, it's usually a, a replacement for human labor. Um, but as, as, we, as things go forward, you know, we're going to have to figure out as we mechanize everything in our lives and manage to produce all these wonderful things without any people, who's going to buy them if they don't have any jobs and don't have any money? Um, so, you know, I, I don't know that it's a negative that we need, we need more farmers. I think it's a positive. Um, I had a really quick comment before my question on aquaculture. <coughs> sure. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. There's actually a really good TED Talk by Dan Barber about a really awesome um, large-scale fish farm in Spain. So that's worth checking out. But my question is, um, this what is the tuna? Is this the bluefin tuna place? Uh, no, it's. Uh, it, I think it's like a l large variety of fish, but um, okay, yeah, it's like uh, a wetland. You should check that area. out. It's it's a really good TED Talk. Uh, but my question was, what recommendations would you make for changing our farm subsidy system in order to promote uh, sustainable agriculture? Oh, God. Well, we'll get to that in this course. Um, we're not going to do everything today. Um, you know, the subsidy question is really complex. Um, it is, uh, and I'm hoping Marion will talk about the farm bill. <laughs> Good. Marion is here. She will talk about the farm bill and relieve me of having to. She's taught a whole course on it which is a very um, risky thing to do. Because um, a lot of people fall asleep when you start talking about the farm bill. I often have to lock the doors if I really, <laughs> if I, if I really get into it. Um, I think the challenge is, you know, what are your goals? I mean, if your goals are producing lots of cheap food, you're going to use certain kinds of tools. But there is no reason if, you know, we, we've been supporting agriculture since the Depression, okay? We have not had a free market in agriculture, and maybe even before then, I don't know, but, but um, it's, the government has been in it in a really heavy way, and probably always will be in it, um, for reasons that we can talk about. But, um, so the question is, how are they gonna be in it? And right now, we are subsidizing, as I suggested, precisely the wrong kind of food. We're encouraging farmers, and we used to, you know, we, we, it, we make it very easy to insure your corn crop and your soy crop. We, we make it very hard, although it's a little better now, to insure your diversified farm. It used to be you had to get a policy for every single crop you grew. So if you're like full belly farm and you have 75 crops, you're not going to get 75 insurance policies. So they were shut out of that market. There are all these kind of subtle ways in which we're discriminating against um, more sustainable farms. Um, but let's say you rewarded farmers for um, using solar energy, 
Okay? Let's say there was, you know, that we're going to give you money anyway, but let's attach a string to it that you have to work on sequestering carbon in your soil. And the more carbon you can sequester, and we know how to do this, um, perennial crops help sequester carbon, uh, stopping uh, fertilizer, synthetic fertilizer helps sequester carbon, um, grazing in a rotational way, applying compost, there are all these tricks we know to sequester huge amounts of carbon. So what if we tied your subsidy to a measurement of how much carbon you sequestered every year? That would do you good because the more carbon you sequester in your farm, the less water you need because a carbon rich soil, and Gary can talk much more knowledgeably about this, holds water better. It has more fertility, so you actually get more plants. It's a win-win-win. There's no negatives to, to doing that. So what if we changed the, the, the goal from as many bushels of corn as possible to as much carbon as you can sequester? It would benefit, uh, it would have a lot of benefits, both environmental and for the farmer, too. And it would reduce the use of inputs, which of course would be a problem for some industries. So th that's the kind of thinking we need to do. And, and I think it's a great exercise, and as you study farm policy, to, to try to come up with some, um, uh, some experiments that might change, because it's, it's all, you know, carrots and sticks. And, it's, and the challenge is, though, that we have to align our farm policies with our larger goals, okay? It's not just growing lots of food and keeping food cheap and keeping raw materials for Coca-Cola and feedlots cheap. Um, but farm policy needs to be aligned with environmental policy and farm policy needs to be aligned with health policy. Right now they're working at cross purposes, right? We're, we're, we're subsidizing high fructose corn syrup and we're paying to treat type 2 diabetes. The government's doing both those things. That's insane. So let's start with trying to align these things. And we'll talk more about these policy. Uh, uh, Mark and I, the last class, will talk about policy in general. I had a question. Yeah. Um, you might have just kind of answered it. But for me, I guess I'm wondering, how do you actually extend changing those goals on an individual and a national basis? Because just listening as like an environmental, for reasons like the world is ending and we need to change it because we want to sustain ourselves, doesn't really seem to get across enough to change the subsidies that are happening and everything else. So how do we incorporate all these goals that need to happen and then get people to actually believe them? Because that well, seems the hardest thing. Uh, I don't know the fix, but one of them is, and this is a, a, a Mark Bittman and I and, and uh, two other colleagues uh, wrote an op-ed piece that you might want to look up that was in the Washington Post in um, December, November. Uh, and one way to do it is to push for, let's have a national food policy. We don't have one. Other countries do have one. Not an agricultural policy, a food policy. Because as soon as you set out to have a food policy, you, you start thinking, what is food for? It's for health. What does food impact? The environment and our health. Um, the land, animals, and suddenly you're like, if you set out the goals of what a sane food policy would do, and the president is talking about a food policy, and, he's, and he has a national food policy council, the way he has an environmental policy council, you suddenly introduce that filter into everything you do. So that suddenly, when you pass your farm bill, if it, if it totally flies in the face of your environmental goals, your climate change goals, you can't do that anymore. It doesn't be, it's not this little parochial thing, special interest thing. You have to suddenly coordinate these things. So that's one way. Um, but frankly, we just need more uh, you know, political energy around food issues. I mean, the food movement is, um, it's very exciting, but it's not yet very powerful. It's not winning elections. Uh, it's not costing people elections. It's, um, uh, it's not getting people into the streets. Um, it's had a lot, of, a lot of isolated victories, and it's definitely something now on the radar of people make, writing legislation and people in the White House, uh, and they're paying attention to it, but they're not afraid of it yet. So we have to build the food movement to, uh, to that point where politicians are terrified of it. All the way in the back. Um, Wait, you don't have a microphone. Wait just one second. 
There's uh, one question from... Um, uh, okay, while you're getting your microphone. Uh, social media, what would you say to farmers in today's uh, food system who feel threatened by the idea of change away from feedlots, monocrops, and big subsidies? What was the beginning of that? What would you say to farmers who um, feel threatened by the idea yeah. of change away from those? You know, I, I have occasion to talk to big industrial farmers occasionally, and I, I, I speak at, at agricultural schools, and, and, and sometimes they come in anger, and sometimes they come in curiosity, and, um, and there is a lot of um, suspicion of people like me and Mark Bittman and other people and Marion Nessel who are, who are kind of pushing reforms in the food system. And, um, but I find if you, and, and they're hearing horrible things about us from their, their organization, the Farm Bureau. You should look into this organization. It's, it's sort of the front group for industrial agriculture, but it masquerades as the farmer's friend. And, um, uh, and they're hearing that we want to destroy their way of life. And, um, but when you actually sit in a room with them or in an auditorium, um, they're all ears. And the reason is, if you can start talking to them about new markets, the thing that your average large farmer, whether they're a rancher selling cattle or selling corn and soy in Iowa, the thing they hate most about their life is that they only have one person to sell to. That they are a small business up against uh, monopolies, essentially. Um, there are very few people who buy your corn. Um, there are very few people who buy your beef. There are four big beef processors. There's three or four people who buy corn. Um, and they determine the price. And you have to take the price. And one of the, one of the things the food movement represents, or could represent to, to, to farmers like that, is an alternative, a way to break out of what's called the commodity trap. It's very hard to make money selling commodities. There's always someone coming along doing a little bit cheaper than you are, and then you have to do even more. And the farmers who kind of break out of that, and they figure out, instead of sending my cattle to the feedlot, I'm going to get into this grass-fed beef business. It's smaller, it's not a commodity yet, the prices are really good, or organic, for example. And um, so I think we need to come to them with opportunities, not with, not with insults and not with um, uh, criticisms. Um, because the food movement represents new markets, and, and some farmers are, are recognizing that. And some farmers have trouble moving. It's very hard to change. Once you're in that corn soy thing, you, um, you, you've got a huge amount of land. It might be in four different counties, um, and you're very dependent on, you know, the idea that you'd have animals and, and have to be on the farm all the time. Many farmers now, they don't make that much money, and so they have a job in town, uh, or they drive a truck, and so they can't be on the farm every day, which limits the kind of things you can grow. Um, so they're in this system. But I, I've met farmers who say, you know, there's this guy doing local tomatoes, and he's, he, wants, he, he, he came to me and he offered me uh, a contract if I put in 30 acres of tomatoes. And, um, uh, and he's canning them or making ketchup or something like that, and so he took, took 40 acres out of corn production and put it into tomatoes, and he got fined by the USDA for like $40,000 because if you take subsidy money to grow corn and soy, you're not allowed to grow what are called specialty crops. That's what they call food in USDA <laughs> talk. Um, because, and why is that? Well, we Californians are to blame um, because to protect uh, produce in California, the California delegation has always insisted that the Farm Bill make it very hard. They don't want to compete, because you can grow really good broccoli in Iowa and Indiana, and they don't want to compete with it. So in exchange for being quiet about subsidies, they have exacted this pound of flesh. Um, and uh, so that's something else we need to change in policy. We have, to make it, we have to make it easy to diversify. Maybe you get more money for the sheer number of different crops you grow. That would help a lot. That would reduce fertilizer use. That would reduce pesticide use. And it would mean more food in the community. Because one of the things that really hits you when you go to Iowa is that there's nothing to eat there. <laughs> and this is, no, really. I mean, all right, you go to the cities, you can find some decent food. But um, in general, it's all processed food. It's like a third world country. They take out the raw materials, which is corn and soy, they move it out to Minnesota or Chicago, and they turn it into processed food, and then they sell it back to Iowans. And this is the best soil in the whole world. You can grow anything in the soil. 
um, but they're growing corn and soy that they can't eat. So anyway, markets. I mean, I think new markets for farmers is, is really what we have to be emphasizing. Cool. Hi. Oh, somebody was waiting for the microphone, mic. yeah. Um, so I was just curious. Um, I think it's really easy to say that, yeah, McDonald's is terrible and soda is horrible for your health. Um, it's easy to say that as people of privilege who have the money to invest in healthier options and locally grown food. Um, but how or is there a way for, in the future, for the food movement to be sort of inclusive of the lower class? Um, is it possible? When can it be happening? I guess that's yeah. my question. I mean, you ask a really important question. Um, and that, you know, it's the most common charge leveled at the food movement, which is that it's elitist. Um, and, uh, and there is some truth to that. Um, although I think you find that the food movement has become very sensitive to that charge and has been working very hard to democratize itself and the benefits of um, fresh local food or whatever you think, you know, good food is. Um, you're finding a lot more talk in the food movement, and Eric Schlosser will be here to talk about this in a couple weeks, um, on labor issues. That wasn't a high priority um, when this movement started. And now you're hearing it both farm worker and food chain worker, and you'll hear about both of them uh, in this class. And the food movement is really making common cause with people fighting, because a lot of the people who can't afford to eat well work in the food business, food industry. It's a huge uh, employer um, and pays terribly uh, for the most part. Um, and that if we're going to be talking about improving food, uh, the people who are growing it for us and serving it to us need to be included. Um, and so we need to find ways to democratize the virtues of healthy food. And it's, is it difficult? Yeah. Uh, finally, though, um, you know, we're faced with this issue of, you know, I started at the beginning and I read that quote from Mark's column, it's all connected. If we're going to really change the food system, we're going to have to change the minimum wage. Um, we're, going to have to we're going to have to give people, make sure people have enough money to buy. I mean, the answer is not to make organic or sustainable food cheaper. The answer is to give everybody enough m money that they can afford the real price of food. That's really the goal. Um, so you can't just fix food. You have to fix this whole issue of, of income inequality. Um, or it's really not going to work. Or you're going to, you know, there's a real danger that we'll move to two food systems. And there will be people who can, you know, only afford fast food when they go out uh, and are the people who have to buy that 1,200 calories for a dollar on their food stamps. And then other people will enjoy beautiful food like these organic Kishu mandarins. Um, and those are $5 a pound at Monterey Market. Um, and, you know, you can, you can get a lot of food at McDonald's for that. Um, and uh, so the equity issue is a, is a key one, and we'll be talking about it, or you'll be talking about it, uh, you know, consistently through the class. And I think that's a really important lens to bring to the whole class. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, and then we'll break. You in the middle. Do you have a microphone? All right. Um, I'd just be interested to know how your research and everything you've learned from these experiences has affected your personal eating? Uh, it's affected it dramatically. Um, uh, my family eats differently than we did when I began this journey. And this was, you know, I began this journey in, I don't know, 1998 or, or 2000 or so. Um, visiting feedlots, I think, had the most profound effect. I really cannot enjoy a McDonald's hamburger. And I once was able to. Um, and uh, I just picture those places. And I picture the slaughterhouses I've been to. And eggs, you know, grown in battery cages. Um, if everybody could visit these places, if they had glass walls, if they didn't fight to keep us out, um, it would change the way everybody eats. Um, the, you know, transparency is a very important thing to fight for because the more people know about how their food is produced, the more likely they are to change the way they eat. Uh, russet Burbank potatoes. <laughs> I buy them organic when I can find them. Uh, and you won't find a lot of organic Russet Burbanks because they're hard to grow organically, but there's tons of other great potatoes that you can find. Or, so I buy organic. I shop at the farmer's market. We're very lucky here in Berkeley of, of the opportunities we have. I spend a lot more money on food, I would say, 
because I care about it. And I, and I realize that, um, you, like so many other things in life, you get what you pay for. And, you know, to the extent that I have that flexibility to increase, I don't, you know, that I don't have to spend the absolute minimum on food, um, it's a priority for us. Um, and, you know, my wife always has to remind me when I start complaining about the price of, you know, I don't know, there was grass-fed organic hamburger for ten fifty the other day I saw, and I was like railing about it, and, um, and she just said, you know, remember your rule, pay more, eat less. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to leave it. I look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Thank you, and have a great semester. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Now, just one last thing before you go uh, to say this. First of all, uh, Michael has done a wonderful job of outlining this complex system we're going to spend time on. Uh, it, the, the, the latent message here is that, yeah, there's a lot of work to do, but the reason you're in this room and you're on this campus is that you are among the best and the brightest. So we're expecting you guys to come up with the ideas that will change the system. Next time, we're going to cover two of the areas Michael uh, spoke about. Uh, I'm going to talk about ecological impacts of agriculture, and Marianne Nessel will be here to speak about the Farm Bill and health policies and, and many other related things to policy issues. So stay tuned. We'll see you again next week at this time. Bye-bye.